Hello everyone this is part 6 of what if Naruto was the blue Uchiha, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below, now let's start the intro. Drowning is the worst way to die. The suffocation for air is too prolonged. The futile flailing only provides false hope for escape. The sensation of seeing the light but falling downwards into the abyss. Since the end of the third war, Blue always fell back into the arms of slumber but, overnight, he died a thousand deaths in the sulfuric embrace of the red-hot waters of his nightmares. Under a pale moon and a night sky devoid of clouds, speckled with stars and as a cold wind from the west blew, he would impact the water from a great height, dropping head first and smashing his skull against jagged rocks of a mysterious reef. But that wasn't how he would die. Bound by his wrists and his ankles so tightly that snapping his joints out of place could give him no semblance of leeway to escape. Descending into the crystal clear water as visibility gradually left his cerulean eyes with the continuous fall, he roared furiously and thrashed despite his restraints. Each night he drowned. It was something he could never get used to. Minato was right, he knew no fear, but what Blue knew then and there was pain. The panic of slipping into the oblivion of death touched his mind and his eyes bugged out, his teeth grit together powerfully until he opened his mouth and released another murderous bellow, exhaling a torrent of water but still unwillingly giving room for more to flood into his lungs. Death grasped his airways in its bony, skeletal fingers and the water reddened, sizzling his pale skin till it turned an anguishing pinkish red and dark purple. Sulfur burned a path down his throat, turning his internals to ash and wresting the bodily control from him, leaving just his insane flailing. He thundered once more, this time seeing a figure stand so far over him outside of the water, it was as if the person was on a cliff, high above the body of water. Stubborn, blistering bubbles exploded from Blue's mouth and nose as life seeped from his being. He grunted, rising up the depths of sleep and his eyebrow twitched. Someone's, sitting on me. He didn't lash out this time, not like that time Itachi woke him up, for he knew who the person was. Blue cracked open his eyes and his vision adjusted to the dim lighting of the room. Moonlight poured in from his widely open bedroom window and a sleepy eyebrow quirked up at the person straddling his abdomen, her small, black fingernail painted hands were placed gently on his white t-shirt covered. The person was in a slightly form-fitting dark purple hoodie that had a pair of pitch black cat ears atop the flipped up hood. The hoodie didn't look too tight and yet it didn't look loose either. It looked custom made. Another thing the person had on was the cat Anbu mask, perfectly covering her face and purple fang-like bangs that went down to the cheeks of the chalk white cat mask. Her light brown eyes shone from the eye holes of the black operative mask, staring into his slowly reawakening blue orbs impassively. Her right hand reached up and she removed her mask slowly, showing her paper pale face and the neutral expression underneath, softly placing it on Blue's face. The man blinked up at her, silent, and she quietly eased herself back, seating her modest behind on his crotch with not so much as a hint of shame or hesitation showing on her face and her body language clearly displayed her straightforwardness. He was wearing grey sweatpants, so he could feel the soft, smoothness of his best friend's behind in complete detail. The Uchiha sniper folded his hands behind his head, not taking off Yugao's Anbu mask, and he smirked underneath. Aren't you too old to be doing this, Yugao? The woman hummed quietly, sliding her hands back from his chest to his hard abdomen. I can never be too old to play with my brother. The ears on top of her hood trembled slightly as the wind blowing into the bedroom increased for a short time. She turned to the window momentarily, her brown eyes straying to the moon beaming down from the heavens, before she returned her gaze to her best friend. You left the window open for me. I did. Blue confirmed simply. I also powered down my launches. His eyes flicked over her shoulders, indicating one of the corners of the room where an automatic version of his midrange launches was connected to the ceiling. This one did not have the setback of only six reloads at a time, as the blue-eyed inventor stockpiled handmade needle projectiles in the ceiling of his house, where more automatic midrange launchers hung, swiveling back and forth all night with no rest, ready and primed to open fire on any unauthorized visitor. You have to be quiet though, Naruto said, his hushed tone soothing. Itachi snuck in some hours ago. He should be sleeping in his room now. A prodigy Itachi may be, but he was still a child, Blue couldn't, in good conscience, hand him a spare key to the house, 
so he keyed the boy's fingerprints to the doorknob of the back door, allowing the boy into his house whenever he wanted space from his parents. Yu Gao frowned lightly and the man wearing the cat Anbu mask titted with his eyes closed. I changed the locks yesterday. It would explain why the spare key she had didn't work and why she had to scale the walls of the house, gaining entry through the master bedroom window. To be able to do that sneaking into the Uchiha clan compound at night, clambering up the walls of the house of an influential Uchiha and entering through the window without raising so much as an alarm was tribute to the woman's skill as a shinobi. Yugao sighed, her shoulders sagged. Want to talk here or downstairs? He didn't respond, his leanly muscled though extremely powerful arms remained behind his head, relaxed, and the purple-haired beauty exhaled once more. Downstairs it is. I'll see you downstairs. She then said, unabashed. You've got a boner. Blue shrugged, refusing to be ashamed. It's natural. Take care of it before you come down. Her lips twisted to the side, mildly entertained by the genial eye contact with her best friend. Or do you want me to? I'm good. Thanks. She raised her hands, yielding with a teasing smirk, and slowly lifted her behind off his crotch, sparing a quick look down and catching the outlines of the meat creature in his sweatpants, finally understanding why Anko called Blue, horsey. Yugao swept off him and marched out of the room, her face controlled and her heart calm. She had been friends with Blue for the longest time, through class, through training, through war and through peace, and in all those years she had seen him naked on many occasions, too many to sensibly and unabashedly count, and he too had seen her without clothes on much too many times to want to casually admit, and she had never once seen Blue aroused. The man was definitely a shower, as well as a grower, but that didn't necessarily mean she had ever seen him grow before. Hey, she turned around as she heard him call her and deftly caught her black ops mask he frisbee through to her, closing the door after herself. Not too long after, Naruto rinsed the sleep out of his eyes over his bathroom sink and rubbed down his face with a towel. The man craned open the door of his nephew's designated bedroom and mutely watched the child peacefully breathe, swaddled in thick blankets and curled up in a ball. The man had given Atachi full control to whatever he wanted with his room, whatever design and at any price he wanted, Blue was fine paying, just as long as the boy didn't mess up his things. The boy chose the strong aesthetic of the Uchiha clan. Cream-colored walls, hard-edged furniture and a strictly organized wardrobe, drawer and reading table. His door was always open his nephew. The boy knew that he could freely sneak into his home and readily expect to see a variety of food in his fridge fruits, vegetables or healthy microwavable dishes that Blue had previously cooked. The man also felt inclined to give Atachi a weekly allowance after the boy was allowed into the academy some months ago. The boy was smart. He saved the money, and though he couldn't exactly make a bank account by himself because he was too young and because his parents needed to co-sign it, he saved the money the old-fashioned way, with a piggy bank, keeping it in his uncle's house rather than at his parents' place. Blue had a rapidly growing trust fund for the boy, but he did give the boy a pat on the head for future wise in saving each rue he got as much as he could, and the boy would bask in his uncle's praise. The man smiled softly as the boy's nose wrinkled, blearily opening his eyes. Uncle, he nestled further into his blankets. Hope, you don't, mind. The man shook his head before the sleep adult child could continue. I don't mind, kid. I'll be downstairs, okay. The boy grumbled, his tired face cracking with a ghost of a smile. Okay, he grasped the blankets closer and muffled into his pillow. Done close tar. Don't close the door, I gotcha. The blue uncle left the child's bedroom door open a little, then he proceeded downstairs. The only light in his parlor came from the television set, though nobody sat on any of the chairs. He heard muffled clattering come from his kitchen and he looked there, seeing that the light was on. He entered and Yugao was bent forward, shuffling around in his fridge, wearing only a pair of lacy black underwear. Full moon tonight, huh? He was pretty sure she had been wearing pants. The woman grunted and looked over her shoulder, gnawing on a stick of dango, before she returned to the fridge. Shut up, man. She said as she chewed on the stick between her teeth. I'm getting comfortable. Blue crossed his arms. You really are. Yugao Azuki might have seemed like an overly sexual woman, but the reality was that she really, really wasn't. She was asexual. She had no interest in sex whatsoever. It made things very difficult for her former boyfriends. The joke of her jacking him off was just that, a joke, she wouldn't have done it and he wouldn't have let her anyway, so it was fine. 
Yugao was simply on another level of comfort with her best friend, and even though he could see the few vestiges of anxiety on her shoulders, she was trying to regain her ease of being around him. Thankfully, she was still wearing her cat-eared hoodie. She straightened up from the fridge, juggling a loaf of wheat bread under her arm, a jar of peanut butter in one hand and a small plastic container full of beacon in her only free hand. She nudged the door of the fridge shut with her foot and ambled to the kitchen counter, huffing as she dropped the items and searching around for a plate and a butter knife. Despite having an offensively attractive figure, more often than not resembling the sleek, mystifying shades of a feline, as well as an astonishingly striking face, Blue was not in the least bit attracted to Yugao. They had history. She was first like a brother to him, then when she passed through puberty and began filling out her clothes, gradually turning from boyishly cute to wonderfully feminine, Blue could now only see her as his sister. No longer the adorable girl that everyone in the village confused to be a boy, the prodigy of the sword had slipped into her mental and bodily growth spurt both naturally and gracefully. Though Blue did miss those days they would rehouse wherever they wanted and the childish horseplay they would have on her father's farm after class. She was rough around the edges and he was too expressive to filter his words. Ah, sweet innocence. The man reminisced familiarly, leaning his shoulder on the frame of his kitchen door. Can't do titty twisters anymore. Same way he couldn't do that to her, she couldn't do that stupid thing where she'd ram her fingers up his ass. He hated that. In her heart and in his eyes, Yugao was still the brash, brazen, overall-wearing, cat-loving tomboy he had grown up with. Was. His eyebrows lowered and his mood dipped. Sensing the fall in the atmosphere, Yugao didn't feel too hungry anymore. She mechanically spread peanut butter on the bread, asking. On our first day of the academy, do you remember the first thing you ever told me? Naruto scoffed with a familiar smirk. I like your hat. They were seatmates, seated around the middle of the class, and she arrived in class after him, dead tired and with only a few fourth-hand class books, including a beat-up jotter and what looked like a pencil but was too chipped for him to truly confirm. She was wearing worn-out jean overalls one size too large for her, a yellowish shirt underneath, a pair of old white converse and finally she had tucked her short, purple hair into a red baseball cap with a pair of black triangles haphazardly sewn on. The genius inventor knew she had sewn on the cat ears by hand and that the side bag of books she was carrying looked to have come from the Shodimes era. He smiled brightly after complimenting her hat, his sky blue orbs closed and his pudgy, childish face glowing honestly. Thanks. She murmured lowly, sliding into her seat and dropping her old side bag next to her feet. She leaned her elbow on her desk and stealthily flicked her light brown orbs at the boy seated next to her. He had gone back to drawing in his small notepad. She wanted to see what he was drawing, doing so ever so slyly, and the boy smirked mysteriously, not turning to her, before he snapped the notepad closed and stuffed it into his backpack, the one hanging from the back of his seat. He replaced it with a book called An Intermediate Guide to Water and Air Pressure, also keeping on his desk a smaller, thicker and more compact book helpfully called Theories of Mechanical Propulsion, Volume 4. Her eyes swelled and she caught the lingering smirk on his face as he glanced at her. He turned to the next page on his book about water and air pressure and Yugao sniffed, propping her head up on her desk as the other kids in their class chitted and giggled without a care in the world. Yugao found herself looking at him again, at the strange boy seated to her left, and her bewilderment became more apparent as she saw him gnaw on the end of a pencil, marking down notes in the book about water and air pressure. He wore simple, unassuming clothes, almost as if he had gotten his clothes from the bargain bin of a clothes shop, a short-sleeved shirt that was a dull shade of green, a pair of dark shorts and second-hand converse, newer than Yugao's but they didn't look pricey either. She decided to take the initiative. I'm Yugao. What's your name? Naruto. Nice to meet you. He gave her the same luminous smile as before, the one that made his face shine. He shook her hand politely. I'll be in your care. Same. Things between him and his seatmate were mild for some weeks. Sometimes Yugao would borrow his notes from Blue because she had slept through class or he would share his lunch with her, clearly hearing the way her stomach grumbled each time he brought out a homemade bento. They hung out outside of class a handful of times but it would take some more time before they would really get comfortable with each other, enough to see themselves as siblings. They weren't as close. The time they had even skipped class in favor of relaxing in the park was because Yugao noticed her seatmate was suffering from burnout. From what? She didn't know. Why? She didn't pry. He looked like he needed a break, so they snuck out of class together. 
he didn't pry into her situation at home and neither did she. Not even when, curious enough, sometimes the seven-year-old boy would enter class with a limp. He would play it off as best as he could but the girl could see the amount of pain he was in occasionally flash on his face. Sometimes she would tap his shoulder, once again wanting to ask him for his notes, and he would recoil. Sometimes she would notice how he was unable to sit up straight on his seat, keeping his right hand on the side of his stomach and his eyebrows twitching from expressionless to hurting, then back again to forcing down his ache. Yugao would stare at him, the question burning on the tip of her tongue but she refrained from asking, not wanting to incense him with her prying. In her eyes, he was being a typical boy, unwilling to show any weakness and stubbornly keeping their problems silent. She was too young to understand that Blue kept his problems to himself because there was no one he could turn to that would provide any useful help. Before she knew it, a whole month had passed. Yugao was a simple farm girl. She woke up before the sun to sprinkle feed into the chicken coop, water the horses in the stable and also let the cows out onto the pasture. That was her morning duty before her father gave her permission to begin preparing for school. The girl was also the youngest of ten children, all of whom her elders were boys. So she already had tough skin, a stubborn chin and a roughish behavior, making her virtually indistinguishable from any other male in their class. Her father, a fairly prominent farmer in Kanoa, had married young and his first wife had given birth to three children before she died of a stomach infection. He married soon after and his new wife had given birth to seven more children, the last being Yugao. The second wife was one-eighth Akamaiki, blood too diluted to completely be part of the Akamaiki clan but she did bear the rosy red cheeks and a subtle swell of her body, closely resembling her distant clan. She used to be a farmhand for Yugao's father milking the cows and such before he asked her to marry him, not even two months after his first wife had passed. The man wanted all his children to be boys. Yugao wasn't an exception. He raised her the same way he raised his other sons, to be a boy. They had a very large farm. They grew corn and they reared animals like cows and sheep. Out of the old farmer's ten children, the second to the oldest was a Chunin and Yugao, the very youngest, wanted to leave the farm life behind and become a shinobi. The other children learned how to read and write from the farmhands the old farmer had assigned to tutor them, soon after he gave his other eight sons permission to attend the civilian academy but only as long as it didn't disrupt the duties on the farm. While he eventually relented for Yugao to begin training to become a ninja when the war hit and the Sandime had released a general order that children from the ages of seven upwards were to register for the ninja academy, and in turn their parents would get small monthly stipend in gratitude for releasing their children to the village for active service. The old man felt it was his function to do so, especially because half of his corn farm had been raised down in the Kumo Iwa coalition ambush. All of Yugao's clothes were hand-me-downs and even her older brothers treated her like a boy. Logically, the purple-haired farm girl had an especially strong head. She didn't like it when people confused her for a boy though. It didn't help that she was wearing boy's clothes, had a boy's haircut, spoke like a boy and acted like a boy. She got fitted with an old katana when a teacher had come to class to evaluate if any one of her classmates were prodigies. It was a written test but the result showed that she could bear a katana as if it were an extension of her soul. The boy next to her wasn't a prodigy. The Sandime had come back to the village from the war front when he received word of a genius of the likes of Orokimaru of the Sanan, his former student, and the Nadaim Hokage, Tobarama Senju, Haruzan Sarutobi's late teacher. Yugao didn't quite understand the fuss, but the third Hokage had said that Naruto was a never-seen-before kind of long-range user and had ordered for a display on the academy training ground. He was facing off against a 12-year-old fourth year that was from the Nara clan. Yeah, she had seen and named the thing he built but that was really it. They stood some yards apart, the older student stood taller with a rigid back and Naruto leaned back lazily, his eyes half-closed and both of his red-gloved hands were in his pockets. The Nara boy was wearing a blue shirt with his clan symbol stamped on the back with dark shinobi pants and the standard weapons kunai and shuriken strapped on each of his thighs, while Naruto was wearing a pure white shirt that had his clan symbol on the right chest and back with black shorts and red sneakers, plus he had gloves, which was very curious. Lastly, there was a backpack on his back. A red-haired girl on the sidelines shouted, You've got this blue. Naruto's classmates joined in, yelling their support for the lax-looking inventor as he stared down the older boy. 
It wasn't a free day but students and ninjas alike could come and spectate as much as they wanted, only the bookish pupils hunkered down in their classes but all the teachers had gone to watch the fight. It was the Sandime Hockage's way of bragging. Another genius had come during his time. The Hockage took his time coming to the center of the field, where the two combatants stood, and he turned to Naruto, familiarly called, Blue, by his classmates, and he leaned down to the boy and said in a low voice. Are you certain you don't want to use those smaller launchers? The boy looked up at the man, his face a clear slate and his sky blue eyes dull of emotion, before he returned his gaze to his opponent. They're jammed. I can't use them. Ah. Well, the man stood back up, visibly disappointed. The others wondered what the man and the boy were talking about. I was hoping you'd show them off, get everyone curious. Blue shrugged, not saying a word. What about the bigger one? The one you used to take out those Kumo ninjas. It is impracticable in close combat. The boy explained shortly. I cannot use it. The man closed his eyes with a sigh. That's too bad. I was looking forward to you using your launchers. The man chuckled deeply, stroking the beard on his chin. The little boy that sits next to you called it what again? He tittered. Crystalline. I feel it is a fitting name, given yours. He looked around, at the cheering people standing a safe distance away. Then his sagely eyes twinkled as he spotted someone, a peculiar blonde pre-teen. The shaded glower of the pre-teen's eyes was directed at Blue. Minato is here, you know. Blue stiffened at the mention of the Fuinjutsu prodigy's name, briefly clenching the fists he had tucked into his pockets. You're trying to rile me up. His head slowly turned up and he stared straight at the hockage, his blue eyes flared and hypnotically shifted into a casually whirring two Tomo Sharingan. He quietly bit out. Stop it. Ho ho. Pardon me then. The boy's eyes only spun faster. The older male leaned down once again and whispered, masking his words. I know you will win this little bout, but at least give a good showing, like I know you would. You show a lot of promise, Blue. Haruzan admitted under his breath, muttering secretively to the boy. More than Jiraiya's prodigy. Quite honestly, I never expected Orokimaru to vouch for you. You must have really impressed her that day. He said, referring to when Blue had sniped down those Kumo ninjas attempting to kidnap Kushina Uzumaki. The man smiled grandfatherly, cheerfully. Regardless of today's results, whether or not you choose to show everyone why I hold you in such high regard, I really do want you head out to the front by next year. The boy grunted and looked around Haruzan, to a festering blonde boy stewing in his envy. He returned his eyes to the hockage, the two Tomo Dujutsu disrespectfully activated and staring right into the older male's eyes. You, my dear boy, are an asset among assets. One thing I regret is not being able to do much to change your father's opinion of you. Lord Hockage. Blue's class teacher prodded humbly. The man looked over his shoulder and straightened up once again, smoothing down his ceremonial cloak. The match. Ah, yes. He patted Blue's shoulder once and left to where the others were gathered some distance from the fighters, close enough to see but far enough to be safe from projectiles. No one expected academy students to know any high-class jutsu. Shikaku Nara endeavored to not look the boy in the eyes, focusing more on the center of his chest, his teacher had warned him that his opponent was a Uchiha. The 12-year-old Nara didn't get why the Hokage was making such a spectacle out of this match but he was obligated to obey and give his all. Troublesome. He settled into a fighting stance, knees bent, his right foot slightly in front of his left, his trunk was straight and his fists were out before his chest. The teacher came between them and the older man waited for the youngest fighter to enter his own stance. Blue removed his hands from his pockets and his knees bent as well, though a fraction deeper than Shikaku's. His middle stayed straight and he kept his right hand, closed, near his abdomen, facing outwards, while his left arm was nearly held out at full length, his elbow was bent though, and his palm was facing Shikaku. This wasn't the famous Uchiha fighting style, Shikaku mumbled questionably in his head. This style wasn't heavy or powerful, it gave room for the legs to move freely and the arms to defend. It could have easily been mistaken for the Jukan of the Huga clan if not for the one fist guarding his stomach and the palm pushed a bit forward guarding his chest region. He didn't expect any strong attacks, given the style the boy used, but the smart Nara was still very well cautious. This is a hand-to-hand -hand match. Ninjutsu and Genjutsu are permitted. Weapons and smoke bombs are permitted but explosives are not. The match will end when one is incapacitated by the other or unable to move anymore. 
the fourth year class teacher explained. Lord Hockage is watching. Make sure you impress him. Uridi. Blue asked, tightening his stance. His left palm curled into the half ram seal. Shikaku copied this seal and snagged a kunai with his other hand, grasping it on a reverse grip. Let's get this over with. Fight. Shikaku raced forward, flashing through hand seals, while the younger boy skipped backwards two steps, crossing his forearm securely before his face and flicking his wrists. A fistful of shuriken appeared between each of his fingers in a plume of chakra smoke. Hide and art, shadow imitation technique. Intending to end the match quickly and get back to cloud watching, the Nara's shadow shot forward as he too proceeded onwards, just as Blue threw two of the shuriken in his left hands, tossing another two from his right soon after the first, and repeating this again once more with both hands a split second later, having his ninja stars violently drone towards Shikaku. The twelve-year-old deftly dodged but his eyes bugged out when the second throw shuriken clanged against the first, curving him inwards at a very dangerous angle. He hastily cancelled his jutsu and skidded to a stop, just barely in time before the four ninja stars clashed right in front of his face. He had to close his eyes as the metal stars sparked brightly, too violently to be directly looked at. His danger senses flared and he blinked to get the bright spots out of his vision. He only had the chance to see Blue reach his right hand over his shoulder, into his backpack, while his left hand reached under to the bottom of his bag. Both came back forward and the crowd of watchers gaped when they saw Naruto notch three arrows onto a rough-looking bow, as if it was a branch that had been sawed off a tree and rigorously sanded to smoothen it out. They weren't quite sure what elastic material was used for the bow but they all agreed that it held its own as the seven-year-old drew it to full length. Shikaku threw up his arms as Blue let loose the three arrows. The smoke bombs at the end of each arrow smashed into his forearms and the Nara hacked painfully as it invaded his lungs. His feet were swept out from underneath him and he felt the distinct sharpness of a blade pressed to his throat. His watery eyes opened and immediately clashed against the swirling blue orbs of the Uchiha boy. Say it. Naruto ordered. I give up. Shikaku conceded straight away. He blinked in surprise at the words that had come out of his lips, but the proctor for the match had already heard him. 52 seconds. That was how long the match was. Everyone was stunned into silence. Yugao felt like she should seriously revaluate her casual friendship with her seatmate. A month into school and not only did she find out that the person she had been sitting next to in class was an Uchiha, but on that same day she, as well as the rest of Kanoa, discovered that he was a genius. A long-range user, a budding marksman and an inventor. The rest of the day, she dizzily attended class, unable to form enough words to speak to him about his display in the training ground. The same could be said about their class. Of course, they knew Blue was smart, he got good scores in pop quizzes and his class notes were impeccable. He came to class on time, he tried to keep a smile on his face and the way he mostly stayed to himself, sketching in his little notepad, clued them in that he wasn't a simple basket case. He wasn't exactly rowdy but he did goof around with the other boys. Sometimes. No one knew what to say. The next day he didn't come to class. Yugao was worried, oddly enough because he had previously forgotten to take back his bento box after lending it to her the other day, the day he defeated Shikaku Nara, he had said he wasn't feeling hungry and she could have his lunch. The worry didn't allow her to nap in class. She was wide awake, taking down his notes and keeping a watchful eye for Blue's arrival. Four days passed and he still hadn't come into class. Yugao had asked the teacher if she could take his notes to him and he had given her the go-ahead but the problem laid on the fact that the Uchiha didn't take to kindly to allowing outsiders into their clan compound, so the gatekeepers didn't let her in. She didn't want to just leave the notes and the bento tin with them, to be sent to Blue's house later because she was worried. She didn't know why. Yugao later found him that same day at sunset, sitting near the lake in the park with his legs crossed and fishing. He had a black eye and a bruised cheek. She didn't say anything, she just sat down close to him and drew her knees to her chest. He didn't look at her, not acknowledging she was there with even a quick glance. He only clenched his makeshift fishing rod tighter and released a tight, strained breath. His swollen left cheek made it hard to do so and Yugao noticed that his black right was squinted shut. Thirty minutes of silence and the sun had long since set. Her stomach grumbled noisily. Yugao flushed dark red. Blue couldn't help but laugh. Yugao put down her sandwich, losing what drive to eat she had, and her shoulders sagged. She turned around and her hands hung limply at her sides. 
The man didn't move from his relaxed position on the door frame, frowning somewhat at the resigned, remorseful and regretful look in her light brown eyes. Naruto, I'm sorry. She opened her say more, anything, but she couldn't. Her lips moved wordlessly for a moment as she shrugged, hands clenching and unclenching before they fell back down. What I did was terrible, worst still that, that I didn't tell you. I thought what I was doing was protecting you, Naruto, I really did. That's all I ever want to do, protect you, but, I guess along the way I tricked myself into thinking, that protecting you from yourself is better than protecting you from the world, and I'm really, really sorry, Naruto. Her name was the very first on the Hokage's order that Orokimaru had leaked to him, even before Minato's own, meaning that the Yondai knew their closeness and capitalized on it. This is my worst screw up, Naruto. I want to understand, Yugao, why would you ever think I was a threat? His eyebrows furrowed and he tilted his head to the side. Because of Zuki. No, Naruto, not because of Zuki. She interrupted, stepping closer, smoothing her hands down the sides of her flipped up hoodie. It was a nervous habit of hers, and her body language told him that it wasn't a fearful kind of nervous. I felt safer and happier then longer than I was afraid. You saved me, Naruto. Then why? I don't think you're a threat. She exclaimed quietly, suddenly remembering that her friend's nephew was asleep upstairs and that it wouldn't really be proper if a seven-year-old boy came down and she was still not wearing any pants. I never have and I never will. He motioned for her to go on. It's, it's that, she tried to form the words her mind wanted to say. You've always had my back. She began afresh. Since we were kids, you've always carried me. Reliable and dependable, that's who you are, that's who I wanted to be but, every time I find a way to mess it up. The only things I can do are feed chickens and swing my sword. Blue's neutral expression didn't break. I thought, well, I hope that this was my way of having your back. She chuckled weakly, humorlessly, and scratched the back of her head. Guess I messed that up too, huh? Blue bobbed his head affirmatively. Yeah, you sure did. The purple-haired woman rolled her eyes. Love and your honesty, man. No problem. He answered easily. I swear, Naruto. On my blade, on my family and on my soul, I never wanted this to happen. I I comma I thought I was doing the right thing. You weren't. Blue replied. Hiding that sort of secret from me, suspecting I was a danger to the village and to myself and rallying on Minato's side, of all people. He breathed out hotly from his nose, drawing himself back and controlling his temper. The mere thought of that smug blonde boiled his blood. He sighed with a sad shake of his head, rubbing his forehead. You let that yellow rat influence you against me. What do you want me to do? Yugao wrung her hands and bowed her head. How do I make this right? Start by telling me what he told you. And she did. She did not falter in her admissions of guilt and the words poured out of her lips like a rushing stream tumbling loudly over a waterfall. He noticed how she didn't blame Minato for manipulating her but rather put the blame on herself, an adult woman with relatively high street knowledge as well as the Anbu Junin rank to boot. Blue could respect that, at least. It was her fault for believing Minato over her own best friend. Yugao told him how Minato had uncovered how Orokimaru of the Sanon was his biological mother, informing her of the speculation that he was involved in some way in safeguarding her escape from the village as well as using his numerous resources in covering his mother's tracks as she scoured the globe unhindered. He had convinced her of how his enraged fire monster self could appear at the drop of a hat if someone so much as mistakenly shoulder-checked him, citing how he snapped Fugaku's arm. He informed the sword prodigy of his ample cash resources, and that he had billions of ruin many untraceable accounts over the globe, though at that time she had responded that she knew her best friend was filthy, stinking rich but she had not divulged to the Yondime that Blue only had two untraceable, undetectable accounts in Fire and Iron Country. Blue's best friend spilled out how the Yondime had told her how Blue was doing his village a great, dangerous disservice from not sharing his schematics for all his launches as well as every invention he currently had, not knowing of the automatic launches that guarded the Uchiha sniper's house or the state of the art workshop that masqueraded as his garden shed behind his humble house within the Uchiha clan compound. Unpatriotic, was what Minato called him. Lastly, and hesitantly, the hooded woman divulged to Blue how the Yondime had confirmed that he, Naruto, was attending weekly therapy sessions. He tied this in with a shaky mental state, constant wartime flashbacks, post-traumatic stress disorder, a touchy, 
rebellious attitude that would flare out any moment from now and a suspiciously sneaky habit of, again, not revealing the blueprints for his invaluable launches, especially Crystalline. Yugao ensured to stress this more. Minato wanted Crystalline. Of him not telling her about him going for therapy, she could respectfully back away. Certainly, there were no secrets between them, but that didn't mean they weren't entitled to them either. Yugao had a few things here and there that she didn't share with her best friend, and this was the same woman that freely talked about her menstrual cramps with him. If therapy helped him overcome the horrors of war, then she was happy that her friend was finding reprieve for the flashbacks. One other thing she told him was that the words he, Minato Namikas, Yondime Hokage of Konohagakur no Sato, had, confided, in her were classified as double S rank secrets, meaning that if it was ever discovered that she had poured them out to the very person the secret was about, she was going to be killed on the spot. Blue tapped his chin thoughtfully, looking at the anxious cat lover wringing her hands nervously. This is everything. It's everything. He swiped her right pointer and middle finger over her heart. Cross my heart and hope to die. Next question then, he said walking past her and idly continuing to smooth peanut butter on wheat bread, finishing the preparation of her forgotten late night snack. He swiftly made three sandwiches and handed it to her, she didn't eat though and that got him curious, Yugawazuki was one ninth Akamaiki, so she did a lot of stress eating but somehow didn't gain the weight. She was clearly distressed now, as pants less and bare bottom as she was now. When did he tell you? Was it all at once? Two years ago and yes. He gestured for her to go one when he noticed that she had more to say. Although he did talk to me personally later, he held a small party in Ichikriku Ramen two years ago, when you were out of the village for a long-term tracking mission to find that Jashinist that ate the hot water daimyo's wife. What was his name again? Blue tapped his chin, thinking back, before he snapped he slowly supplied. Hidden. Hidden. Yugao confirmed with a nod. Blue remembered that mission. Hot Water was an ally of Kanoa and they were having a problem with the cult of Jashin, the goddess of slaughter, and this quarrel had escalated when a prominent cultist snapped and murdered the daimyo's wife during a formal meeting to settle a land dispute. The other cultists and the daimyo's wife's guards had been unable to stop the insane priest from crunching his teeth into the dead woman's neck. Hidden fled the country and the cult of Jashin severed connections with him for his barbaric, cannibalistic outburst but the hot water shinobi were terrified of him, so they didn't send out anyone from bring Hidden to justice. That was where the blue Uchiha came in. The specifics of the mission was that they wanted Hidden to return to hot water, bound, gagged and with his chakra suppressed alive, though that was a bit redundant seeing as the Jashin priest was immortal. It took Blue three months of tracking Hidden's last whereabouts, following clues and consulting contacts and connections before he found the man in a small hamlet in Stone Country, mercilessly terrorizing the inhabitants. The Uchiha sniper had used a special set of senbon that had been narrowly hollowed out and filled them with a thin liquid that stiffened the muscles, making movement nearly impossible, and he fired those senbon from a distance of 700 kilometers away, three into the pupil of Hidden's right eye, one to his heart and another one to his calf. He was particularly proud of those shots. Hidden was a very fast man. Blinking out of that memory, he put his attention back into what Yugao was saying. He closed down the whole stand and paid for everyone's ramen. Naruto's mind could put it together easily. Minato gave them one of his famous winning smiles, inviting them to eat to their fill and that everything they consumed was on him, whether it was drinks or food. Then he told us everything I just told you. They sat around a large, recently constructed table in the ramen stand and Minato laid out his troubles to them concerning Naruto, Blue, Uchiha, making it look and sound like he was deeply sorrowful for the damning words coming from his mouth and that he always had Blue's well-being in his heart. There had been a council meeting an hour before we went to Ichikriku Ramen, so the guys in the council already knew what was going on but the rest of us me, Kakashi, Tenzo, Kurianai, Anko, she looked up to the ceiling as she listed them off, recalling the wives of the male counselors. Io Yamanaka, Shiro Abarame, Kin Huga, Asuma, Eru Akamaiki, Yuna Haruno, Genma, Hayat, Abiki, Yugao screwed her lips to the side. UHM. Don't sweat those kind of details. Well, for all our friends that weren't in the council it was news to us. Shock registered on their faces and the members of the council present, from Chu Minazuka to Chuza Akamaiki, nodded affirmatively. 
their surprise only seemed to increase when the Yondime Hokage passed around official reports on the suspected wealth of the Blue Uchiha, the amount of secrets he refused to divulge and Fugaku's medical report. Anoiki refused to give us any records about your therapy sessions. Blue pursed his lips and crossed his arms, bobbing his head slowly as he slowly passed her. She turned as he passed by her, holding the forgotten plate of peanut butter sandwiches. But he did say that you weren't a bad guy. You have your demons but you were not a threat. Naruto mumbled almost soundlessly. Good ol, Anoiki. Minato, asked us to keep an eye on you. She said, coming to a finish. Because he can't always be watching you. He said that when you snap, he would be there in a flash. I see. Naruto, she quietly called, nearing him with the sandwich saucer in her hands. Her eyes were down and her brow was furrowed, one single thing spinning in her head, one she couldn't wrap her head around. Why is Minato doing this to you? You said it yourself, he's fixated on Crystalline. Probably thinks it'll make him super famous, or something. There has to be more to it. Well, the Uchiha man hummed. The Minato I know is different from the Minato you know. He casually took a sandwich but he didn't eat. The one I know is childish, self-centered, envious and proud. That, doesn't sound right. It's a matter of perspective, man. Blue explained. This is going to sound crazy. Try me. His best friend interrupted, her eyes hard and resolved to do whatever she could to patch up her relationship with Blue. Her head was craned down, fixed to the ground, but her shoulders were strong. The man took the plate of sandwiches from her and dropped them on the counter. If you don't think I'm crazy, his right hand moved to her chin and he lightly grasped it, lifting her face to look at him. Sky blue clashed against Mocha brown. His other placed on her head and pulling back her cat-eared hoodie, so he could see her face clearly, sliding down to her right shoulder. Look me in the eyes and say it to my face. There was a turgid pause after that. Yugao's lips opened fractionally, intending to say the words he wanted to hear, the words she dearly meant, but the look in his eye, that stormy gaze that traveled deep into her soul, told her to be absolutely sure before she spoke again. After this, there was no going back. A repeat of what she had done and she would be dead to him. The purple-haired farm girl turned swordmaster stood up straighter, her shoulders strong and her chin tipped up more as his fingers on her chin relaxed a little, barely ghosting over the skin. She nodded firmly, hearteningly. I don't think you're crazy, Naruto. She said with an underlying promise. Not the way the Hockage says you're crazy. He sees everything as a competition. Blue continued from where he had left off. Minato cannot grasp the thought that someone in the village can do something he doesn't even have the slightest knowledge about and that the person is being recognized for that knowledge. He will do anything to absorb the other person's knowledge into his own, somehow. His hand dropped from her chin and the one on her shoulder fell. From what I can guess, and his guesses didn't usually lead him astray. The class order on my head was meant to discredit me and throw doubt over my record as a shinobi, making the people I know distrust me and think of me as being mentally unstable because I refuse to make public the schematics for Crystalline or show Minato the courage he so dearly wants. The tall Uchiha shrugged carelessly. The class order being made known to me wasn't his intention at all but he swerved into the skid, adding a layer of secrecy around it concerning why exactly my friends are wary, so that the distrust and doubt would build over time into a tense bubble, until I, eventually, snap under pressure and do something catastrophic to reinforce the gaping suspicion. He smiled laughingly at the mortified look on his friend's face, a mix between her friend's educated guesses and at his unmindful reaction to everything going on. When I do, he will, leak, this outburst out to the rest of the continent, throwing more mud on my face as well as making me lose plenty of my investments once the companies I've invested in discover a crazy person, has money with them, driving me bankrupt. Because I'm not a shinobi anymore and I can't leave this village, then I won't be able to fix the damage done to my reputation. Blue snagged a sandwich and ate, swallowing two bites before he proceeded to the fridge, where he got a skin of goat milk. He served out two glasses, one for him and one for Yugao, and handed the mystified woman hers, chugging down his own. No friends, no allies, no money and no prestige left to my name, Minato would think I would either truly run mad and kill whatever is in my path until he arrives, in a flash, he rolled his wrist and smacked his lips as he downed another glass of cool, sweetened goat milk, biting into his sandwich once more. 
or, Blue swallowed, I could give up and hand him every single one of my schematics, so that he could bail me out with some money, give me back my job and have real power over me cause he's my benefactor and savior. He then tapped his chin and pointed out. There's also the chance that now that I've found out about the Class A order, he'll want to dispose of me sooner rather than later, probably within the week. Could be tomorrow, who knows. The man didn't say any more, fixing his gaze on the woman as he went for another sandwich. Yugao blubbered in morbid surprise. Ger bur mu, ha. Huh. The sniper smirked widely. Crazy, right. S sometimes, she stuttered, shaking her head and tipping the glass of milk into her mouth, wiping her lips with the back of her hand. Sometimes I forget just how smart you are, dude. She chuckled wistfully. That was scary. Naruto's only response was a deep laugh and a roll of his eyes. Is, is that really what the hockage is up to? Sure looks like it. I believe you. She said confidently, holding out her right fist and her eyes only steeled over all the more. He bumped it. I know. What Minato didn't know was that Blue wasn't helplessly disconnected from the outside world, not in the way he thought. The Hokage could think all he wanted that the village post office and telephones were his only way of messaging his contacts, connections, allies and friends outside of the village but the blue-eyed inventor wasn't a newbie when it came to tracking and stalking. The head of the post office would flag his letters and hand them to the Yondime for vetting, essentially blocking them from getting to the outside world because, knowing Minato, he would read those letters and store them in his library. The phones around the village were being listened in on, and admittedly that wasn't out of the ordinary for any village. He only used his phones to call friends outside of the village anyway, no vital intel was exchanged. As said before, the Blue Uchiha had a system for sending and receiving messages with his contacts and connections, one that was untraceable, quick and effective. Snake summons. Naruto, Blue, Uchiha was his mother's son, of course he had the snake summoning contract. A few things Naruto did want to do with haste was to solidify his network of contacts and connections, organize his finances with his fire and iron accountants, including but not limited to his savings, investments, attach his trust fund and the anonymous donations he made to restoring a handful of towns and villages in the northern outskirts of fire country that were struggling to return to normalcy since the war ended. There was also the village Orokimaru had created in Frigid Country, where the Iwa children Blue rescued all those years ago were currently residing, the village hidden in the sound, or hidden sound. His son and mother had said he shouldn't worry about money, she was plenty wealthy enough to provide for them because of the medical research facility she had set up in the secret village, but Blue didn't want to leave the burden of those Iwa children on her shoulders alone. So he sent over money to the village every month, the fire accountant said that the money transfer was done in several parts and in several names to unrelated accounts in frigid country so as not to draw suspicion. Blue's accountants were professionals. They knew what they were doing. What are you going to do now? Yugao suddenly asked, snatching the last peanut butter sandwich before his paws could grab it and biting into it triumphantly. Blue's eyebrows twitched irritably at his loss. You are going to put on some pants. Atachi could be down at any. Blue. Atachi yawned from the top of the stairs, groggily rubbing his eyes with the back of his hand. His unfocused eyes saw light coming from the kitchen and he called again, coming down the stairs carefully. Blue. Uncle Blue. The man corrected as he went round the purple-haired woman, standing at the kitchen door. An invisible smile slipped onto Atachi's tired face at his uncle's reminder. How many times do I have to tell you? Uncle Blue. He corrected himself. Are you with someone? I heard voices. You gals here. Hearing her name, the Junin's head peeked out of the kitchen and she smiled brightly at her friend's nephew. How's it going? Hello. The boy greeted. He came down the stairs and he rubbed his eyes once more, shaking off the last bits of sleep. The purple-haired woman was now wearing a pair of dark purple jersey shorts that perfectly matched her dark purple hoodie, with black socks on her feet. The smile on her face toned down and she said, I hope we didn't wake you up. No, I was thirsty. The seven-year-old child said, nudging his way past her and getting to the sink. He found a glass cup and took two sips of water before he poured the rest back into the sink. I can't sleep, uncle. How about we watch a movie? Prodigy or not, Atachi was still a child to Naruto. The man held out his hand for the boy and the child took it, allowing the man to guide him to the parlor. Atachi hopped onto a chair, while Blue turned to his television. He took the remote back with him to the couch with the remote and relaxed on his side while the boy reclined on the other. 
What do you want to watch? Him. Itachi pondered this question. Is there anything from Suna? Not that I've heard of. Movies and TV shows from Hidden Sand were few and far in between but they were excellently made, award-worthy, if he said so himself. There's a new superhero movie from Hidden Saltwater. Yugao felt out of place, standing there behind the couch. She blinked once when Blue looked over his shoulder and asked her. Know any good movies, Yugao? UHM, there's one that's running on the Snow Smoothies channel. I heard it's a horror movie but I haven't watched it yet. That one, please. Itachi said, sitting up as his uncle flipped channels till they got to Snow Country's movie dedicated channel. The woman eagerly leaped into another chair as the man got to the channel, just in time too because the horror movie was just starting. Two hours later and Itachi was fast asleep, shockingly the boy had been nodding off to the scariest movie Yugao Azuki Anbu Junin, prodigious swordmaster and war veteran had ever seen in her life. Blue was man enough to admit that the film got a few good jumps out of him too. It was now 1.11 a.m. The boy slept inconsistently, waking up and sleeping at different intervals at night. It wasn't something Naruto could easily correct. The man tapped the boy's head and the child took this mutually understood, unsaid command to amble his way back up the stairs and back into his bed, doing so with a lethargic grumble and with his eyelids too tired to fully open. Yugao stayed over for the rest of the night, sleeping on her best friend's bed while the man stayed awake downstairs, watching movies and planning out his next few steps. He got off the couch and quietly crept upstairs, quickly checking in on Itachi as the boy snoozed peacefully in his bed and then he checked Yugao, confirming that she was safely huddled in his bed. The third and last bedroom-sized room in his house was remade into his study. He entered his study and flicked on the lights, leaving the door open in case his nephew awoke and went looking for him. Naruto settled behind his desk and pulled out two reams of paper, an open-ended cylinder that held a few pencils, some pens and some clean brushes. He picked a pen, removed the cap, slid a piece of paper out of a ream and began constructing his final orders on the eventuality that he would die. Not another hour later, a flurry of letters and scrolls left his study via his snake summons, slipping out of the house through the study window and melding seamlessly with the night. Because you're an asset, doesn't mean you aren't disposable. Minato had told him that when he had confronted him in his office. Unfortunately, Blue was right when he said that the Hockage would dispose of him within the week. Ooh. At that same time. Unknown location. I have more than enough sacrifices. Danzo said dully. The success of this plan lies on your end of the deal. Minato exhaled with a shake of his head. I feel like I am the one putting my neck out. You forget, if this dubiousness is discovered, then all blame goes to me. The one-eyed warhawk said this too calmly, too emotionlessly. He tapped his walking stick on the ground once and the trees of the forest rustled erratically as the wind increased. The Namika's Hockage raised an eyebrow at the display, hearing the muted footfalls of dozens of shadow-clad shinobi as well as spotting eyes around them. Root was built on a foundation of covert, illegal, operations. For the good of Kanoa. Minato finished with a lax wave of his hand, unimpressed by Danzo's small display of authority. I would have shut you down if I did not have use for you, Danzo. The man's hard face didn't shift at the Yondime Hockage's remark. Inside, he glared at the boy. It was only a matter of time. The blonde cage straightened his white with red flames howry as the root hanging around them in the darkness flickered away. Anyway, no one will find out anything. There won't be any outside witness. As you say, the deal was that you get his eyes and the chakra left in his body, and I get his weapons, crystalline and all. The man didn't care how exactly the Yondime was going to get his hands on those inventions, but the man helped him with that. If Naruto doesn't have them on him, then I can get Fugaku to let me into the Uchiha clan compound to raid Naruto's house. He smirked proudly. I'm sure I can negate any security seal he has on his place. Danzo's dull eyes blinked once. What shall we use to bait the blue one out? This plan will fail from the start if we do not have an important enough bait to lure him there. The hand holding his walking stick tightened. What about the boy? You mean Itachi? Yes, the blue one holds him in high regard, my spies tell me that much. Or do you suggest we use your wife? Then we will have to kill them after. Minato answered with a humming smile, his eyes closed pleasantly. No outside witnesses, remember. There's a chance that the QB will be released and I'm sure Itachi's mother will not be pleased. This has nothing to do with the boy's mother. 
What of the Izuki girl? Danzo supplied. My reports say that she was the reason the Blue One lost control of his emotions in Zuki. We don't need a hostage. Minato said with finality, giving the old retiree a larger-than-life smile. Relax, old man. I already told you the plan. It'll work. Trust me. Are you certain that Seal will contain him? Danzo changed the subject snappily, not wanting to address the cage's disrespect. Minato's head fell back as he laughed amusedly, detecting the low, fearful hesitation in the old man's voice. That man isn't so powerful, Danzo. You give him too much credit. A frown twitched down. Are you telling that to me, or to yourself? The man narrowed his eyes and walked past the old man, back to the village he ruled. Today, Danzo. 8 a.m. When the Yondime Hockage was long gone and Danzo was by himself in the forest, the one-eyed war hawk nodded once, almost too solemnly for one with his reputation. The wind blowing through the forest increased once again and the canopy of trees blocking the light of the moon swayed, allowing a few stray beams of pearly white light fall onto his old, weathered face as he stared up at the starry night sky. Yes. He brought his face down and faced the path ahead, beginning a steady trek further into the forest, just as his shinobi rushed about him in the secrecy and silence of the shadows. The blue one dies today. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.